the crew boats started operating, and they are still operating. They're on the other side of the Mustang Island. You can't see them from the very end. They'd be, if you will, on the north side, and they're still in operation. And from 2000 to 2008, Texas Treasure Casino ship had a headquarters and a mooring site on Must on Harbor Island. So quite a dynamic place has changed. What's the future look like? Well, there is some rumor about that Mustang or Harbor Island may have a new future. There is a, a talk about uh, cruise ships mooring there in the future. So we'll see if Mustang or Harbor Island doesn't open a new renaissance for itself. A lot of our island belongs to the Corpus Christi Port Authority. It belongs to the Port of Corpus Christi, a, a large part of it. Some of it belongs to the state of Texas, that'd be the Fair Atlanta Park. And I do believe part of it does belong to the city of Port Aransas. We definitely put our, cities, our, our city limit sign out there. If we look at the oil depot that I discovered a few moments ago, this is what got us involved in World War II, this town. The fear was that a German submarine would come through the Aransas Pass under the cover of darkness. Sailed down the pass on the surface, sent about there, and with torpedoes, torpedo the oil tankers that were moored there, and with their deck guns, shell the oil storage tank. And at this time, this oil farm was the fourth largest in the nation. It was truly a strategic, a strategic uh, war surplus. I know you've heard about the dune guns, the coastal guns of Port Aransas. This is why those weapons were in place in the dunes. These are the locations of these two weapons close to where the uh, MSI is, Marine Science Institute. If you'll ask, people will tell you that you can still see the maps of where these weapons were in 1942 to 1945. So what was the strategy here? Why did they mount those weapons there? These two locations are where searchlights at the start of darkness started playing back and forth on the entrance of the Aransas Pass to reveal anything coming through. There was a curfew. We couldn't come through the pass for a certain hour. The weapons were trained down to engage anything that did come through the pass. And so that's why they defended, and then defended it well, because the U-port did not uh, come through and interrupt that important uh, war site. The jetties gave us trouble and vision. When the men came to work on the jetties, they discovered the Aransas Pass was alive with tarpon fish. And these men, many of them engineers, wanted to go fishing on their off days. Well, these guys were from Galveston, Oklahoma, New York, Corps of Engineers from everywhere. So they looked around and said, well, who can take us fishing? And of course, it was Mustang Islanders. So suddenly, our economy became one of the fishing guide. In about 1900, the fishing was so good that a number of wealthy fishermen built the Tarpon Club, this palatial looking thing, and it was a deep palatial, on St. Joseph Island. To go fishing, they were picked up there by Mustang Islanders in these small rowboats and taken fishing. But the, it's, uh, the, uh, the wealthy fishermen said, it's too slow. This rowing thing, we want, we want to go out, catch our fish, and get back and enjoy our wine and our cheese. So they started buying the Mustang Islanders power boats. They said, this is what we, we, we want you to use. And they gifted some to the Islanders. One Islander, the bottom, named John Collar, turned out to be a very good businessman with his power boat. He would tow boats behind him like a little line of ducklings, go and anchor those boats up by the jetties. They would fish, would pick them up about noon and tow them back. 
Of course, he was getting one or two, three dollars for every boat he towed out there. So it was an interesting combination of fishing guy had a pretty good business head. It was the introduction of power boats to the guys that gave us the Farley Boat Works. In 1914, Fred Farley came here and he and three of his sons started the works that were greatly successful until 1973. Of course, I hope most of you know that the Farley Boat Works has now been rebirthed and uh, is in fine business on Avenue C. I invite you if you hadn't been there to go and see how wood boats were built. Sorry, this is a new machine. Uh, first time I've used it. This would be a Farley boat. Classic open boat. This was been 1931, pitch 32. Farley boat, two guys fishing here. And it was on one of these fishing trips that the chiropractic tarpon, that story came to pass. The fellow was fishing named Dr. Richard Sutton. And Dr. Sutton is the guy who eventually wrote Silver Kings of the Aransas Pass, published in 1937, which became internationally the book that brought the fishing world's attention to Port Aransas, Texas. Dr. Sutton said, and he was well fished. He had fished everywhere in the world. He had hunted everywhere in the world. He said, the finest fishing for tarpon is in Port Aransas, Texas. Well, he was fishing one day, the fishing guy, um, Don Farley, as a matter of fact. And he tarp and unhooked on his own, leapt down on the water, and hit Dr. Sutton squarely in the neck. Knocked him to the bed, or bottom of the boat. He was unconscious for three or four minutes. When he regained consciousness, he said, praise God, my neck doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> Apparently, he had had a chronic neck problem for years. And his claim was the blow from that carpet had somehow rearranged his cervical vertebrae. I personally wondered if the fish didn't hit him in the head, but, you know, if you feel better, you feel better. I'm not going to bore you or make you listen to another Roosevelt fishing story. Um, if you've been around here a time or two, I'm sure you've heard of them, or to just go to the museum and ask the docents or look at the Manny boat. You can learn a lot about the Roosevelt trip in 1937. But I'd like to tell you a little maritime factor too that was kind of interesting. FDR did not stay on Mustang Island when he came here to fish. He stayed on the presidential yacht right here, the Potomac. The Potomac had a a good history with FDR served as his personal uh, ship through uh, his, uh, his ten years until his death. After his death, uh, the uh, Potomac went into disuse and was eventually sold after World War II and had a number of different owners over the years. Elvis Presley was one of the Potomac owners. Eventually, she was rotting away at a dock. Elvis uh, didn't, uh, didn't, didn't rock and roll on the Potomac. And a group in California picked it up in the late 80s and has totally renovated the boat now and published not too long ago the fact that the that smokestack, the rear, the aft smokestack, was entirely fake. It was a fake in that it hid the elevator mechanism that took FDR from one deck level to the other. As you know, FDR was wheelchair bound. You might also know that that was not revealed to the American population through his tenuous presence. Imagine trying to make that work today, to have the press that it coordinated with any form of government. You've seen so many pictures of FDR, I thought I'd show you one of the people who, who made those pictures. Here's the press boat, shooting him. On the day he caught his tarpon, and the scale from that tarpon is right down the tarpon in the main zero. As I said, he did not come on this thing out. He stayed on the presidential yacht. But FDR did go to see Joe Arnold. He went there as a guest of Sid Richardson, a wealthy Texas boy man, who was a friend of FDR's, and said, please come have lunch at my ranch house. So when FDR got to St. Joseph's, there was a question of how to get him in the wheelchair ashore. 
So Mr. Richardson and his placeros, his cowboys, his quick thinking, dug out a cattle chute, put it next to FDR's ship and said, Mr. President, come ashore. Well, FDR was looking at this at some scans of, really? Sid Richardson, in his best Texas crawl, said, Why, well, Mr. President, you're the biggest bull to ever come down that chute. <laughs> and with that, FDR rolled down and a good, uh, a good lunch. <clears throat> The harbor we see today in Port Aransas was very different in the 50s, 60s. There was a big commercial fishing operation here. In this case, these guys are these guys are shark fishing, and they're harvesting the shark fin for shark fin soup. We used to have a shrimp fleet here, bay shrimps. And here would be the Port Aransas fisheries the heart of the commercial fishing industry. Various, big part of our maritime world, three levels, privately owned, owned by New Oasis County, and finally state owned in 1968. This individual that looks very much like Popeye was Mr. Tabor, who was a very captain, and on occasion he would get on the deck and do the Popeye dance for, for the kids. I never got to see him, I'm sorry I didn't. Anyone here get to see Mr. Taylor? Did you? Must have been something. Up board when we will change the economy of Port Aransas. If you look at this picture, fishing off the jetties, three smiling faces. What you don't see in the picture is a fishing guide. The upboard and order boat mentioned could come down here. Launch your boat easily and go fishing without a guide. That's what started to change our economy. Instead of the heavy guide business, the guides had to get involved with ice, bait, selling fuel. So it broadened our economy in this town. The airport motorboat has also had implications for ecology. This is the fall of a of a current bay boat, and this is called a tunnel. Essentially, the bottom of the boat is curved out. And this little mechanism here allows the engine to run at a tilted position. That boat can run in about four or five inches of water at 40 miles an hour. And that can really tear up a lot of the, of the, of the flats area and run fish off those flats. That's why if you've been in some of the bays, you'll see the this is restricted to polling only. And so, uh, the state of Texas is trying to stop the use of the, of the jackpot boat. Port Aransas are doers. In Port Aransas, to a great degree, if you need a boat, you build one yourself. The Pollyanna has the best shrimp on the Texas coast. I'm sure you'll agree. The Pollyanna is owned by Mr. John Nixon. The Pollyanna was built by Mr. John Nixon in his backyard. Mr. Nixon built the Pollyanna in two halves. This is a picture of half of the Pollyanna going down Potter Street. The other half will be over here. This was parked at the boat launch. The second half was brought to the boat launch and they were welded together there and launched to be the, the, the fine vessel that it is today. Look at all the ships and all the maritime history I didn't get a chance to talk to because of those damn tangents. And I'll get you every time. I thank you very much.
A couple of things before we let you go. The reason the decorations are so posh tonight is because the place was set up for the garden club. They're having a party here tomorrow, so please try not to mess them up as you leave, because they'll take it out of my eye. Thank you, folks. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank <laughs> you.